My name is Kim York, and I work with the KDE Munis team. I hope everyone is having a good day so far, and let me begin by introducing you to the rest of our team. First, we have Kristen Lambert, who is our team lead and a technical analyst on our team. Myself, Kim York, I'm a technical analyst as well, and Kathy Pelletier, who is our Tyler Technologies vendor partner. You can reach us as a team on our team mailbox at municipateducation.ky.gov. We uh, work with state reporting, so if you have any questions in regards to state reporting, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I would like to ask if you are willing to share, to use the chat feature and say yes, if this is the first time you will be processing PSD or CSD reports, only if you're willing to share. Um, you can also use the chat feature for any questions you may have through the webcast. Uh, we will have three stopping points, one after discuss, discussion of EPSB, the second after discussion of um, CSD, and then after PSD. But feel free to ask questions as we go along. Um, Kristen will be monitoring the box for that. I also want to mention before we get started that this is a process that you can begin now. It officially starts September 15th, and we'll be talking about that date as we go along. But you can start this process now and start eliminating errors that you may have and be much better equipped when September 15th rolls around. It looks like we've got a lot of people um, that this is the first time. So know that if you, you, know, you need some extra assistance, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to help, um, especially if it's your first time through this process. Um, so let's get started. So we'll begin with the EPSB ID import program. The EPSB ID import report, it builds a file containing teacher EPSB license numbers to upload into Munis. It's going to match the import file to the last four digits of the social security number and the date of birth of the employee in Munis. It imports the associated EPSB ID into the state ID field on the employee master. And that's something important to remember because a lot of people have problems, you know, when it, when it actually imported in, seeing where it actually goes. But it's going to import into the state ID field in the employee master. So I'm a very visual learner, so I like to use graphics. And this is kind of a graphic that gives you the overall process of how you bring EPSB ID numbers into Munis. So you're going to begin an infinite campus by pulling the validation report. You're going to make corrections to that validation report. You'll then pull the EPSB ID report. Once those corrections are made, then you'll save that report to your computer. You'll then upload that EPSB ID file to the EPSB program in Munis. You'll check the error report make manual corrections in Munis, and then you'll run your PSD report and watch for error 50. So this is basically your process, and we're going to talk about those steps as well. So the validation report is where you begin. It's pulled from Infinite Campus. This is your pathway to this. Um, and when you get to that path, you're actually going to be able to pick between two reports, but you want to pull the validation report first. And this is what the validation report looks like. It reports actively employed staff, including those with no EPSB license numbers. So if you'll see on the report, the last column is with Ys or Ns. Yes, that it's going to pull into your report or no, that it's not going to. Um, y being um, you know, not as worrisome. If it's, if, it's, if it's marked Y, it's going to pull into the report. What you want to sort and filter for are those that are marked no because you want to be able to make sure that those people are not supposed to be pulling into the report. So the good thing about the validation report uh, that they have set up for an infinite campus is that if there are any missing fields, as you can see there, they're highlighted in yellow. So if you go to, you sort by the ends and you look to see if there's any information missing, add that information and then pull that report again. You want it to be as accurate as possible and pull as many people's e EPSB ID numbers into Munis as possible. So corrections to staff records in that validation report must be made in Infinite Campus before you pull that file. Make it as clean as possible. And if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to Crystal Darnell in the Division of School Data Services, and we've provided her email address as well. Our team does not work with Infinite Campus. Um, 
we work strictly with Munis. So if you have questions about Infinite Campus, you'll need to reach out to Crystal. So this is what the EPSBID import file looks like. It's an Excel format. And you want to remember that this is the file you want to import into Munis, not the validation report. I have many people that will call and say, um, let's see, I apologize. I think I'm getting ahead. So, okay, so are we, is everyone seeing EPSV ID import file? Kristen, is that what you're seeing now? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I must have gotten ahead a little bit. But please remember to not import the validation report. I have many people who call and say, I can't get this, this report to import into Munis. And I'll ask, are you importing the EPSBID file or are you trying to import the validation report? The validation report will not import. So this is your pathway to the EPSBID import program. Um, your, it's your pathway and once you've reached that, the EPSB numbers will import into the state ID field of the Employee Master. And again, that's something you need to remember. It's going to it's going to first import into the state ID field in Employee Master. Then when you generate PSD and CSD, then it will actually import into the EPSB ID fields in those reports. So the EPSB ID appears in the EPSB ID field when the CSD PSD reports are generated. That's just what I was saying. So you actually have fields that say EPSB ID in both of those reporting areas. Only in Employee Master will it import into something called your state ID field. So errors. The two errors that you can receive when you're importing um, your ID import in is import file does not match an existing employee in Munis or a duplicate last four of social security number and date of birth. That's the only two errors you will receive. And we'll talk about what you can do if you receive those. So the first one, import file does not match an existing employee in Munis. The last four digits of the social security number or date of birth does not match an employee in Munis. So here it could just be that you have some of this information incorrect in one system or the other, either Infinite Campus or Munis. You just simply need to figure out what is correct and make that correction uh, in the database that you need um, to make that correction in. And then employee may not exist in Munis. And some instances of this is like when you have technology teachers that use in campus for scheduling, but they're not true um, actual employees of the district that will be in Munis, and you'll come across that then. The second error is duplicate last four of social security number and date, and this is rare. We had it happen one time that I've seen, and it was just because some information was entered incorrectly for two employee um, that you, sh you should rarely ever see anything like that. And if you have an employee in the employee master and the terminated employee master, you may see that error as well. Then you would just need to manually enter that information. So when you get your error report, you're not actually going to be able to, to figure out who that error is for. And so what you would need to do in that instance is look at your error report and look at the record number of the person who is receiving the error. Then go back to your, your import file and look at that record number. So if you see the red arrows are both on four. So the import um, error report has record four. You go to record four in the import file. It gives you the last four of the social security number and the date of birth, all of which are things that you can search in Munis to figure out who that person is. So if you're, you want to enter any missing EPSB ID numbers, so once you have generated the PSD records, you want to check to see if you have any missing. You can choose search, enter less than zero in the EPSB ID field, click accept, and then you'll, any of those that you find, you'll want to manually enter those EPSB ID numbers into. Do remember that if you manually put things in PSD CSD, it's not putting an employee master. So next year, if you go to generate and you haven't entered that EPSB ID number into the Employee Master, you're still going to have the same thing of having to manually enter. So anytime you can go back and put that information in Employee Master and keep it correct, you're better for the next year. So once you've imported, the only error that you're going to be watching for at that point is error code 50, which says there is no EPSB ID number. So you've exhausted all your looking and things and you're still missing one. 
Um, you'll need to figure out what that number is, and you can utilize the validation report sometimes, but you'll need to find out what that number is and manually enter that EPSB ID number into state ID and employee master and regenerate, or you can manually enter it into the PSD records themselves. So in the past, we had been told that when people applied, you know, they weren't, they didn't have access to an employee's EPSB ID number that had just applied. But we have since found out that that is not the case. You can actually get that number immediately when that employee applies for their EPSB ID number, and you get that in the KEX system. Now, this is not a system that our team works with. But this is a system um, and I'll have information for who to contact if you need more information on this as we go along. But you'll go to the login for the KEX system and log in. You will then um, search for a profile. You'll search for that person and you can search by um, the last four, the social, their name, date of birth and find that individual. You can then um, generate a report. Um, it's you'll go to reports and you'll generate the district role report, and um, that will actually take you to. You want to want to save it. Let me back up. You want to save it in .csv format, and then this is what you will see. This is the report as it pulls. It ex it exports to Excel. You can expand it so that you can see the full EPSBID numbers, but you should have their EPSBID number as soon as they apply um, for it through the through the system. And if you have any questions about um, finding the EPSB number in Kex, you'll want to contact Melinda Penny, and we have her email address here for you as well. So a little FAQ about EPSB is why is this process necessary? So we're trying to secure private information. We don't want to use social security numbers. And by you know, being able to use these EPSB ID numbers, it just protects um, private information of employees. And the next is our district did not enter EPSB numbers for our staff, but many of them already have one. How did this happen? So for several years, KDE has imported staff EPSB ID numbers into Infinite Campus. Staff were matched as carefully as possible and EPSB numbers loaded for those where a match was found. Some staff may have a certification in teaching and others may have an EPSB ID number for other reasons. So are EPSB numbers required for classified staff? No, they are not. Classified staff could have them. They may have had positions in the past that required them and they're in the system, they're an infinite campus, but they're not required for CSD staff. Like Kim said, there's no reason to wait. If you have um, employees that are, you know, you pretty much are fully staffed, you can go ahead and start running these reports and working on them. Uh, no reason to wait until the 15th. If you have any employees that you employ um, between now and the 15th, they can still be added to the report. Um, but, but if you have time to get a head start, you can go ahead and do that. So if you have if you have any questions about the import file itself, then you can reach out to us on the Munis team. And again, I told you, you're going to see this email address in several places. It's munisateducation.ky.gov. Let's hope that it doesn't drop again. So we're going to start out with the CSD, which is a classified staff data report. And an overview of this report. This report produces an electronic file of classified employee information. It's required to be submitted to KDE no later than October 1st, but this year you have a one day reprieve. It's October 2nd because October 1st falls on a Sunday. So you will have until Monday, October 2nd to get this submitted. It's produced using employee data from Employee Master, Employee Job Salary Records, and Job Class Master Records. So the summary class codes for someone to fall on the CSD report is between 7,000 and 7,999. The group VU is going to contain CLAS for classified or RCLA for retired classified, and they are hired as of September 15th of the fiscal year. Allocation codes seem to be the one area in CSD and PSD that people have the most issues with. Um, you want to think of allocation codes as GL codes. So it's kind of, you really look at it as, as each allocation code is really a GL code. And an employee, so in this case, an employee performs a single job, but at several locations. 
we will that that employee will have multiple CSD records due to the allocation code set up on the job salary record. An example here is an instructional assistant works equally at four elementary schools. There will be four CSD records for a base pay with FTE of one on each record. Now, we, we, I want to differentiate allocation and FTE, and we'll talk about that as we go along. That, that, that's the two terms that people tend to intertwine. But and it would be an FTE on one of each of the records and an allocation code of 25% is what that's representing. If the contract is for 186 days, the contract days reported on each CSD record will be 46.5 days. The base pay records for a single job class code will always equal 101 for allocation and the days will always add up to the standard contract. The FTE percent is to be one on all records. And what, what creates, there's a calculation of the annual salary, the reference salary and the days that are prorated to give you the actual FTE percent. You'll see that as we go along. So again, I told you that I'm a very visual learner and I like graphics. So here we have Betsy and um, Betsy is working one job class code, one job, one total FTE. And you'll see that, but it's broken down into four allocations. So she's at four different locations. So it breaks each job down by percent. So the 425s will equal the 100. Um, the 46.5 days on each record will will actually add up to her contract days. And that allocation is what helps with the calculation. So now we talk about FTE. So employees who perform multiple jobs will have multiple pay records with an FTE of less than one on each record. So only if they have multiple jobs will that FTE be lowered. If they're doing one job, the FTE is one on all records. But if they're doing two jobs, the FTE is going to be less than one on each record. So an employee is an instructional assistant half-time and a supply service aide half-time. Each position or job class code will have an FTE of 0.50, 50%. If the same employee was an instructional assistant at two different schools, the instructional assistant position would have an FTE of 50 still, but that allocation would break down as well because there's going to be two different GL codes, if that makes sense. So. Here is my, my graphic. We have um, Bradley. He's got two job class codes, one location. So he's 50% an instructional assistant and 50% um, a supply service aide. So his FTE is 50 on each of those records to add up to one FTE. And so here we're adding an allocation, right? So at the first, at the first, um, first job position he has his instructional assistant, He's doing it at two locations, so two different GL codes, right? So he's going to have two more records in um, CSD to represent those allocations. And hopefully these graphics as you go along and or as you're actually doing your reporting will help you see what you need to do. So let's discuss a hybrid employee. Uh, you'll get a note at each of your CSD, PSD reports that says check for setup of hybrid employees. This is just a reminder for you to verify employees who are serving in a classified position, but paying into TRS are included on the CSD report. So you have your Frisky directors, your CCLC directors, finance officers, school nurses. These are a few of the people that can have this. The only time that an employee pulls to PSD is if their job description requires an EPSBID number, if they're required to have a teaching certificate. If they are required to have that teaching certificate, they're on PSD. If they're not required to have the teaching certificate, they are on CSD. That's really important. It's not the retirement system they pay into. It's whether or not they are required to have a teaching certificate. So generating the CSD records, um, this is simply your pathway to the CSD report and the screen that you will see once you follow that path. You'll need to do a successful, you'll need to hit generate, of course, first. Then you'll need to do a successful define and accept and then choose execute from the ribbon. If you have errors, you'll need to output, output the error report and correct those errors because you cannot submit as long as you keep getting error reports. And the screenshot you see here is the information that you would put in Define for this fiscal year, for CSD that is. 
So manually updating CSD records, you can do a search for a record, hit update and make changes. But do remember any changes you make in CSD records, if there is information that needs to be added to Employee Master, it's a really good idea to go and add it at that time so that you don't have the problem next year when you need to update a CSD record for someone. You can also add a CSD record in the same format. Um, you know, some information can be added directly to the CSD records. However, it will only be accurate for the current reporting process. The employees must exist in Employee Master before you can create a CSD record for them. And you follow the steps as listed to add a CSD record. The note here is what I'm stressing is that KDE strongly recommends adding the information to the Employee Master and or the employee job salary records whenever possible to avoid the same error when future statewide reports are generated. And so creating the electronic file. Once the CSD records have been reviewed and edited, a file must be created for submission to KDE. You'll find all records and then simply select the electronic file button. A CSD file will automatically be created. Um, the file name appears at the bottom of the screen and you'll make note of it so that you'll have it for the submission process. Running the report is a 30 second process. It's correcting the errors is where um, your time is going to be consumed. So submitting the electronic file, the electronic CSD file to KDE, it must be again submitted by October 1st, but this year, October 2nd, it's submitted through the Seek Data Web Submission application, and we're going to cover that later in the presentation. So here are your most common CSD report errors. These are the things that come up um, you know, most commonly on your error report. That first one is 6.50, which is an invalid object code on your CSD record. The problem here is that an object code on the CLS, CLAS Group BU and summary class code in 7000 range does not contain an appropriate GL object code. Valid ob object codes for CSD reporting are 0130, 31, and 60. Invalid object codes will create a CSD error. And in your PSD and CSD guides, you're going to see a, a, a page long grid that has some of the information that you see here on it. It's going to give you all the valid object codes and things for all of the group BUs. I highly recommend going to that guide, pulling that page out and just taping it up somewhere as you're going through this process so that you can match these group BUs up with the object codes and uh, make sure that you're making those match. You wouldn't want a um, certified group BU with a classified um, object code. So these are the things that you want to watch for. And when you get error 650, it can actually prompt others. So you could have four errors for John Doe. And when you correct one thing, it'll correct all four. So don't be, don't freak out if you see John Doe with 12 errors. It could be a simple fix and it take care of all of those errors as you go along. Another one is, is your error code 11, which is no race selected. The problem here is that no race selections have been made on the Employee Master record. If you choose no, not Hispanic or Latino on the Employee Master and, and it is selected in the ethnicity field, a race must be selected. So if you choose no, not Hispanic, you have to go down to the ethnicity field and choose um, an ethnicity. So under race, you may not choose two or more races. This is something that the governing body that we send this information to does not want us to choose. You can choose two separate um, races, but you can't choose the option for two or more races. And we can't change that. Um, Point Master is not you know, a state specific report. So it's not something that we can alter. Um, to look the way that we want it to look so that two or more races is going to be an option there. We in Kentucky just cannot choose that. And if you have a question about that particular thing, please reach out to finance.reports at education.ky.gov um, and they'll be able to answer more of the why you can't choose that. But if you choose yes Hispanic, then nothing should be marked under race. So um, if you choose no, you've got to choose something else under race. If you choose yes Hispanic, you don't choose anything else under race. If you do anything beyond that, it's going to give you error 11. So error 16 is an invalid summary class code. Again, that little grid that, that you're seeing at the bottom of this screen, 
there's a full page of all of these things that you can match from left to right to make sure you're matching um, group BUs with object codes or that you're you're using the, the correct summary class codes. So the problem with error 16 is that a summary class code outside the list of valid KDE codes exists on the pay record. So to correct this, you update the job class master with a valid summary class code. And we've also given you a link in this um, to uh, get to the employee classification codes. OK, so you also have error 26, which is an invalid BU job class object code. Again, that grid that you'll pull out of um, the PSC or CC guides also going to give you this information as well. But the problem here is that the error will generate when employee has an invalid combination of group BU, job class code or object code. And the correction is simply to go to employee master, job salary and make those corrections and you should be fine. Error code 35. So what you're going to see in uh, both CSD and PSD is there's a calculation for salary that has to mesh. It has to be within plus or minus of $25 um, to check this error um, and be able to move forward. So for CSD, it's your hours times your contract days times your rate of pay minus the annual salary. It needs to be within plus 20 plus or minus $25. And so the problem here is during the generate process, a calculation of hours times contract days times hourly rate is compared to the amount in the annual salary field, and it must be within $25. The correction is to update job salary records to reflect the appropriate information. So many times districts will have a job, employee job salary set up and they don't have an annual or a reference salary there. Um, sometimes they don't even have the hours because maybe they don't know how many hours that the person's gonna work. Um, you have to correct that in order to report that salary, or if it's something that you can't report, you would delete out that record in CSD. But this calculation, um, if it doesn't work on the employee job salary records, you will get error code 35. And the most common CSD warning is that you don't have a finance officer reported. And it's simply a warning because your finance officer and it's the 7166, 7184, 7185, 7186. It's going to look for one of those summary class codes. Um, if you know it's on the other report, simply disregard the warning and know that it's going to be on the PSD report. So that's simply a warning, and it wants you to make sure that you are, in fact, reporting a finance officer on one report or the other. So we're going to stop here and see if there's any questions about um, CSD reporting. Um, okay, so, Kim, yeah. thus far, no, no questions. Okay. Anybody oh, well, here's any one. Okay. Um, so in the chat window, it says, what if we have a certified teacher who is retired with an active EPSB ID and has returned to work in a classified position? Would they be included on the CSD report? We're actually going to cover that in more detail in the PSD section. So let me hold off on that question because I think you're going to have that answered when we get to the retiree section of the PSD. So Jennifer, just hold out and you'll see what happens in that situation. And again, I apologize for the technical issues. I, it, everything just went blank for me on my end, but I'm glad we're back and it seems to be running well. Fingers crossed. OK, so I'm going to pick up. Is um, anything else, Kristen, any other questions? That That's asked? it. The only other okay. thing is, you know, people are wondering if we're going to have the presentation and yes, it'll be sent out afterwards. We'll have a link. Probably we'll put it on our SharePoint site um, with the link to it because it's usually a pretty big um, document and that that's it. It's going to be recorded so you can come back and watch this later if you have other questions. Sure can. OK, well, we'll, we'll move forward. OK, so. OK, so we're moving on to the PSD report and an overview of the PSD report would be that it's professional staff data report that produces an electronic file containing certified employee salary information 
to be submitted to KDE no later than October 1st. And October 1st, again, is the official date each year. But again, you're getting one day extra because the first falls on Sunday. The PSD report uses data from the employee master file and employee job salary records for employees hired as of September 15th. And the requirements for being on the PSD um, records, um, is it an employee status? Sorry, it blinked and I thought it was going to go away again, but it didn't. So employee status on the employee master record must be set to active. Employee pay records must contain valid summary class codes 0010 to 3999 and or 5000 to 5999. That's the extra jobs, extra service jobs. Employee job salary records must have a group BU of CERT or RCERT. That's certified or retired certified. The accuracy of PSD data is essential as it is used to report to the federal government and state legislators. So first, the first thing you've got to do, the order um, upon which you submit CSD, PSD, or salary tables to um, your SEEK data site, um, you, can, you can submit CSD at any time, but the salary tables must be submitted before you submit PSD. So you want to remember that. You can't submit PSD until your salary tables have been submitted. So the salary tables, you've got your base pay salary tables, will be submitted for comparison to the actual PSD files. And that's kind of why the salary tables need to be there when you're submitting your PSD files so that it can link to those salary tables. The tables will be used to verify each employee's base and extended day reference salary and that it corresponds to the salary tables. Salary tables must contain at least 40 steps for each greater rank and each table must contain the same number of steps. Naming scheme for the salary tables must conform to KDE requirements for certified base salary. So, Jennifer, this is going to be your question that you were asking. And um, it's retirees, the, the four different scenarios where we have retirees. And the first one is that retirees returning to work as a classified staff member, CLAS or RCLA, should have a summary class code that falls in the 7,000 to 7,999 range. Retired employees that retired paying TRS return to work in the district in a classified position that requires a four-year degree and they will pay into TRS or coded to RCLA Group BU. Retired employees that retired paying TRS return to work in the district in a classified position that does not require a four-year degree will pay SIRS and code it to CLAS Group BU. Retired teachers hired back in a position requiring a teaching certificate will have a Group BU of RCER. They should be pointed to, and I want to say that this scenario is the one that we see the most of. Um, so this group should be pointed to a retired employee salary table the rate of pay is negotiated involving maximum amounts set by TRS. They should pull into the PSD report. However, and this is the big however, the grade step will be blank on the PSD records when records are generated. KDE does not compare the reference salary to any salary table as long as the group BU has been set to RCER. And I think that's the biggest thing that I see with retirees. A lot of times they're just put back in as regular certified CER, you know, group. R I mean, just the CERT group and they're not RCER. So if, if it's not marked RCER, it's going to look um, at those grades and steps and then you're going to throw an error. So it will not look at the grade and step if you have them um, set up in Group B is RCER. So that's the important thing to think about. So extra service pay. This is some important items that we're going to cover. Extra service pay. Certified employees who receive extra pay must have a separate employee job salary record for each extra service job. Extra service job salary records must reflect a job class code linked to an allowable extra service summary class code. All certified extra service summary class codes are in the range of 5,000 to 5,999. And a certified employee job salary records for those employees who receive extra service pay must contain the appropriate object codes, 0112, 13, or 14. 
So um, FTE mid-year hires working in one position, partial year employees will be updated in the PSD file with a full year of days employed when the file is generated. Days employed fields must stay at the number of contract days the district has set for the full year of standard certified contract. The reference salary field must contain an amount reflective of a full year salary. This is important. The reference salary means this is the salary they would get if they worked the full year. So you want that to be whatever it should be because the calculation on the FTE is going to be based on that. So the next item in red, the annual salary will be the salary the employee will actually receive for the number of days he or she will work. So that's the difference in the reference and the annual. The reference should be set to a full year, the annual to what they should receive based on the number of days of the fiscal year they actually work. The FTE field needs to reflect the percentage of the standard contract days, the number of days employee will work represents. So the example here, the employee is hired after the start of the school year and will work 170 days of a 187 day contract. You divide that 170 by 187 and you, to the 10,000th position, 0.9091 would be their FTE and that's how it calculates everything else. So the resulting FTE will have to be manually updated in the PSD file after it is generated if it has not been entered in the job salary record. The FTE must be entered to the 10,000th position. That's really important. So employees working in multiple positions. Employees who work in more than one position should have multiple job salary records. An example here is an employee is 50% high school classroom instructor and 50% media specialist. Each job salary record will be set up reflecting a portion of the total annual salary because a person can only be one full time person. If they're doing two jobs, you need to say what percent is high school instructor? What percent is media specialist? That's really important. So your note here, um, first note is allocation codes can also be used in conjunction with FTE when needed. And that's going back to where we were talking about um, Bradley having two positions and one at two different schools. You may need to use both allocations um, and FTEs to get the percentages correct. And the second note here is error 27 and error 2720. These errors may print erroneously on employees who are working in multiple positions. You'll wanna review those PSD records, make sure they're set up correctly. And if they're set up, you can disregard that error. No update would be, would be necessary. So important item six is our grade and step. The grade and step for employees having multiple job salary records should be the same. And again, when we're talking about hybrid employees, you want to verify that employees serving in a classified position, but paying into TRS or set up with a group BU of CLAS and object code of 0130. These employees must be reported on the CSD file, not PSD. I probably stressed that 10 times through this presentation, but it's the one thing that um, districts get have the most confusion about or hybrid employees. So creating the salary table file, um, an electronic file of the MUNA salary tables are created for submission to KDE. The file um, is submitted through KDE through SEEG data web submission and in order to submit successfully the tables must reflect the following. The naming structure must conform to KDE standards, the salary table file for the PSD submission must contain at least 40 years of data for each grade, and all steps must contain the same number of steps. Example, if rank one, step one contains 44 steps, then all tables must contain 44 steps. And here, there's more in-depth information on a lot of these things in the PSD and CSD guides on the MUNIS guide website. I highly recommend that you pull those guides and look through them and use this presentation only as a tool to aid those guides. Those guides are very, very important. So creating the salary table file, this is simply your path. You're actually going to go to the Kentucky PSD report, and then you're going to select salary table, the salary table button in the ribbon. The salary table screen appears. You'll click search to find the appropriate salary tables by entering um, search criteria into the effective date and grade rank fields. You'll select accept to pull the files and the following screen will display. You'll select the electronic file from the top of the screen. And again, you'll want to note that um, file number 
so that you have it to submit to KDE. So this is simply your path to generating the PSD report. This is the screen that you will see. You will choose generate and choose define. You'll enter the information for this fiscal year. You'll choose execute and output any errors and correct them. Again, running these reports take literally 30 seconds. And um, but it's a matter of clearing up the errors because you cannot submit a report. You will not get the <laughs> you get a report that's accurate until you have all of those errors out and you cannot submit them until the errors are away. So resolving PSD report errors. Errors can be resolved by correcting the job class master, and this is what we highly recommend. Anything that can be corrected in job class master or your employee master or the employee job salary records is the best way to make any of these corrections. Then you can go to the PSD report and simply search for that single employee and choose recalc, and it'll recalc for that person only so that you're not having to regenerate the whole thing in case you've made you know manual changes as you've gone along you can recalc for one person you just want to remember search for that individual person and then hit recalc and that's after you've made those corrections in job class master employee master or job salary and as we've said before multiple errors can exist due to a single problem on employee's record for any, the example here is an employee's record contains error 16 which is an invalid summary class code this may also kick out error 6 no base pay record if the only base pay record for the employee is the is the record with the invalid summary class code um, and the good one thing to remember too is when you pull your error report it's going to tell you which job the error is on in in your employee job salary records because someone could have i've seen 16 and 18 employee job salary records with probably 10 or 12 different um, jobs that they have but the error report will tell you which job that you need to look at for that error and that helps a lot so manually updating PSD records this is the same as we discussed in CSD you can you know update a record but it, it's always wise to remember that if you can go back to employee job salary or employee master and make those um, updates and then do a recount for that person, it's always better because that information is going to stay there. If you manually put it in just the PSD record, you may pull the same thing next year and have to manually update again. It's always good to make the corrections in employee master or job salary when, whenever possible. And same thing for adding PSD records. They have to have an employee master before they can be added. Same as CSD, same path. You'll select add, enter the information and select OK. Again, if it's information you can add to employee master, employee job salary and do a recount for that person, that's always the recommendation. I can't stress that enough as you can hear. And the electronic file. So creating the electronic PSD file. The electronic file must be created after the PSD records have been generated. Find all records and select the electronic file from the PSD report screen. After the file has been generated, the export file name will appear at the bottom of the screen. Make note of that name for submitting to KDE. So submitting the file, the PSD CSD file should be submitted by October 1st, again, October 2nd this year, submitted through the SEEK data web submission application. Um, and note here again is that the salary table file must be submitted prior to submitting the PSD file. You will not be able to submit your PSD file if you have not submitted your salary table file. And if you need to submit a replacement electronic file, you need to email finance.reports at education.ky.gov. That is another division of KDE that is not us. So we cannot, our, our KDE immunity team cannot replace an electronic file. You need to email that email address, tell them you need to have them um, delete the file so that you can, or deny the file, I should say, so that you can resubmit a second file, should you need to do that. So the most common PSD report errors, again, base pay, there's no base pay record, error six. This error test checks to ensure there is a base pay record, object 0110 for all employees in the PSD record. Correction check to make sure there is an object 0110 record for all certified. So you can't have, you know, an 0112 without an 0110. You've got to have a base pay record before you can have extra pay, you know, or anything like that. 
and 6.50, which is an invalid object code for PSD records. Again, those grids that I was showing you in the CSD records, they're in both books, they're both in both guides, I should say PSD and CSD. It's a single page and it has those grids listed showing you how to look for um, correct object codes to match uh, group BUs. Um, and you just want to make make those ch updates if that needs to be corrected. If you've got a certified job with a classified 0130 object code, that's not going to work. You're going to get an error. So check to make sure the object code is a valid certified payroll object code. And error code 26, which is the inaccurate summary class code for an object code. Same thing. If you'll see to the left of the grid, you'll see that it gives you the summary class code gives you a description of what that class code represents, and then it tells you the object codes to the right that are valid with those. So summary class codes 0010 to 3999, you want to use 0110 and 0111 for uh, PSD, 5000 to 999, it's the, those extra service, 12, 13, and 14, 7000 to 7999 are classified, that would be you know CSD, but that's part of this grid that you're going to see in the guide. And so below are the number ranges to be used when a district wants to add a new job class code along with allowable object codes for each group. So please remember that um, you can use both the summary class code and that same summary class code for the job class code if there's nothing that you want to be distinct about those numbers. But let's say that John Doe it, um, has a job and Jane Doe has, a, has the same position, but she does a little bit different. You can, they would both have the same summary class code, but you would create a job class code for Jane Doe to differentiate the job descriptions. So when you look at the bottom, you're going to see that 4000 to 4999 certified job class codes, the object codes that you can use for that as well, the, the 6000 range and the object codes you can use in the 8000 range and what you can use for that. And those correspond. So the 0010 to 3999 that you see in the first grid, and you see 4000 to 4999 in the bottom, that's the corresponding job class code. So if you want to create your own job class code for this particular position to create you know, a difference in it and another, you want to make sure that it's in the 4000 range. It's gonna, that's what you're gonna create your job class code. If it's an 010 to 3999 summary class code, and you're creating your own job class code at your district, it's gotta be in that 4,000 range. So just, again, there is a full page in the PSD CSD guide that has all this information listed so that you can be sure that you're matching up all of these summary class codes, job class codes, group BUs and object codes, and making sure you're matching them uh, correctly. Because nine times out of 10, when you get an error, it's almost always that something is not meshing, it's not matching well. So PSD code 44, yes, you have to have a kindergarten instructor coded in the district. And I know this seems like a silly one to add, but I don't know how many districts say, you know, do we really have to have a, a kindergarten instructor coded in the district? And you do. Um, they have to have a summary class code of 2025. If not, you're going to get this error code. You cannot submit without having that. And 2720, this is the one that we talked about that can also print erroneously, but it's checking your reference salary by the FTE minus the annual salary. That's This is the calculation for salary in the PSD record that's got a mesh within $25. So Munis will perform a calculation on the PSD record. The reference salary on 010 records times the FTE must equal the annual salary. An error is generated when the amount is outside of the parameter of plus or minus 25. So you want to verify that the job salary record contains a correct reference salary for their base salary on the district salary tables that you have submitted to KDE, and then verify that the reference salary amount listed on the PSD file agrees with the salary table. Again, this is the calculation for PSD. So warnings that may appear, uh, most warnings regard necessary positions to be reported on the PSD report, just like the kindergarten teacher. You're going to get warnings for things that it wants you to make sure. Um, and in the second bullet, you see that that's a finance officer. We talked about that earlier. You're going to get that on both reports. As long as you've got a finance officer reported on one or the other, you're fine and you can disregard that warning. But it's a reminder to be sure you have 
a finance officer on one report or the other. So we're gonna stop here for questions on PSD reporting. Does anyone have any questions here? Hey, Kim, um, okay. Tammy asked about using 160116 for speech, the object code there. Um, I think it was back in your grids for, you know, what's allowable and what's not. I, is that a base pay or is that an extra supplement? I started and it's what will actually, I don't think 0116 is an object code that will, I, I, I want to verify that Tammy, okay. but I don't think 0116 will even pull. Um, it looks like a, she says increment. So I'm guessing that's um, an additional additional pay and it's probably something I'll, that we I'll, need to look at maybe talk to Karen. Yeah, I, I will have to look into that. I'll, I'll talk with Karen Conway a little bit about that. She's actually watching um, this presentation. Karen, do you have anything to add about the 0116 for speech? If you're there. Oh. It looks like it's a sal it's a salary supplement that is there she goes. It's not pulled. OK. We only allow, I was thinking it wouldn't because 0110 to 0114 is what is set in the parameters to pull. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for chipping in on that. And Thank those you, are Karen. the only questions we had thus far. Well, the only other thing I have to say is that if you have any questions at all on state reporting, you're, you know, please email our team. If you email our team box instead of us individually, um, oh, it, create, it, it creates an error. Well, because you'll probably need to delete if it is it. So is it sounds like ran, yeah, I need I need to to look a little more into this, but it creates an error. What to do with it? Well, it, yeah, it Tammy, we will double before, check with Karen. Yeah, we're going to yeah, Tammy. I need to see. I would like to see that specific thing that you're getting the error and what it looks like. Are you able to get any kind of screenshots that we could? I mean, not for now, but for later, but it would be good to have some screenshots to see what it's pulling. Because I think yeah, it's after this, oh, Tammy, if you could yeah, get with absolutely. us, we'd appreciate it. I think 0116, Karen, if I'm not mistaken, that's a new object code, right? We were told to change from 0113 to 0116. Okay. So we'll Tammy, check I'll, after the webcast yeah. and get some more information. Um, that on is new that. for me, Tammy. So I'll have I'll definitely have to look into this and see what needs to happen. So Karen, you and I can get together too first, probably. So but anyway, if you have any questions for our team, please use our, our team email box, municipeducation.ky.gov. That reaches um, myself, Kathy, and Kristen. And if one of us is busy with another district, you know, another person can get with you. And um, but I'm gonna hold out for just a couple of minutes to see if there's any more questions. We will get back with everyone, hopefully in regards to this 0116 error and see what we can find out about that as well. Well, thanks, Kim. That was a helpful webcast. Maybe <laughs> after all these years, I'll start to under PSD CSD <laughs> reporting. I, I can it's dip my toes and answer a lot of questions, but Kim is definitely the expert when it gets down to the more um, complex um, scenarios. And it's, it's a lot. This seems like a lot of information. It's it's really pretty simple when you're taking it one report at a time and just looking at the errors you receive and correcting them. That's really all that it's about is getting those errors corrected and how you do that. And um, I saw there were a lot of people that were doing this for the first time. So if you need any you know additional assistance, I've, I'm always I always want to help those that are doing it for the first time. So it doesn't seem overwhelming. It really is not all that overwhelming. Um, it's a lot of information and I hope you can use this presentation as a tool, um, but don't let the amount of information in any way scare you from this report because it's really, it's just, it's a very basic thing and just correcting the errors. Okay. Of that so, being said, don't wait till <laughs> the last couple of days to generate your report yes, and start working on it. <laughs> Agree. Start it uh, now. You can run this report a thousand times and see those errors and go ahead and start correcting them, you know, and correct them in job salary and employee master when you can, because then you, when you generate, they're going to they're going to be correct at that point. So. That's all I have. Um, I will okay, stay we'll tight. Just for sit a few here minutes. on quiet if anybody yeah. has questions. Right. And everybody's free to leave.
Thanks, Kim. Welcome. Thanks, everybody.